everyone and welcome to NFL Girl UK Meets. I'm Liz Bandari and this is a show that brings you closer to the game you love. Joining me this week is Brendan London, former wide receiver and both Super Bowl and Grey Cup champion. Brendan and I talk about being an NFL player and part of the New York Giants, the difference when he joined CFL team Montreal Alouettes, plus setting the foundations for when your playing days are over. Enjoy the show! Welcome to the show, Brandon. How are you? Uh, all is well. Uh, try not to go too crazy. You know, no football on, or no real football. But uh, <laughs> but uh, in terms of, you know, having to watch replays and all. But at the same time, just trying to stay busy, stay productive. Thanks for having me on. No, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. Obviously, you and I, we've spoken on social media for what feels like ages. So it's it's nice to, like, properly talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we feel like family, family already, uh, just because <laughs> that's one of the good things about social media is how it can connect people with uh, like-minded interests and all, you know, together, especially with, you know, the bond of football. And so it's, it's cool. Nice to finally chat. Absolutely. And you've got some pretty cool accolades under your belt from college to NFL <laughs> to the CFL and now your career in media. Um, how was your experience at like UMass? Like, how much did that prepare you for the next level? Uh, UMass, it was a constant grind there, just because the teammates that I had there, the Victor the Cruises, uh, the James Ahedabo, who ended up winning a Super Bowl championship with uh, the Patriots, we had a, we had a championship type caliber uh, mentality there. Our head coach Don Brown. Um, you know, who brought us to a national championship, oh, well, FCS national championship my, my senior year. He really got a lot out of us and, you know, pushed us. So I think that got me prepared not only for my time in professional football in the NFL and CFL, but also in the media as well, because you have to carry that same mentality uh, that you had for athletics that you do uh, now in your new life, per se. Absolutely, and I guess it must feel like quite a bit of a culture shock going from like college through to the NFL too. Uh, yeah, I remember my first day uh, in the Giants facility. It was back at the Meadowlands. You know, it's not at that new facility that they have. Uh, well, we have now. Uh, so um, I, I have a suit on. I wore a suit my first day at rookie camp. You know, that's when you do the physicals <laughs> and all that. Um, but I'm walking through the locker room to go, I believe, from like you know one physical station to the next, and there's Eli. I guess he had just finished a, a workout, and you know he was he was had his workout clothes on, he's just hanging out by his locker. And I just remember, like at that moment, I'm like, wow, that's Eli Manning. That's the guy that I played with on Madden, and and you know that that's Eli Man. I'm in the facility. I'm in a locker room with Eli Manning. He kind of like like looked at me because I was like sitting there staring for a little bit and like he kind of like looked at me and I was like and then I like came to and just kept walking so um it's just a new world a new experience but it's for the better oh, sure. did you get quite starstruck then <laughs> not so much starstruck you know it because growing up as the son of a football coach yeah. uh, my dad was a D1 football coach growing up so I've been around college stars who eventually turned into you know NFL stars uh, as well but you know during that time so I've seen I've been on the sidelines I've been around you know well-known athletes my entire my entire life but it was just that moment for me to where it was like now I'm official now I'm in the facility in the locker room there's Eli Manning you know your journey has officially begun so that was the moment of awe I wasn't like starstruck it was just that moment of awe is where it's like wow your journey has officially begun Amazing. And in the lead up to the Giants Super Bowl, I understand that you helped the the defense prepare by taking the role of Randy Moss. How did you adjust your own style to help the team prepare? Well, it was. I mean, it was one. Of, it was an audition for me. Every day was was an audition when it came to you know being a practice squad player. And for me, every day was the game. So I really tried to take my mind into being you know, Randy Moss, you know, physically and make the plays that he made because when you're on the practice roster, you're on the scout team, especially at receiver, when you look up at the card, they have the card that's drawn up, the play that the Patriots or whomever team usually runs. And at that time, you saw the 81, the route that was highlighted for him. 
it would be highlighted because it meant throw the ball there. It was telling, I believe our, our, our scout team quarterback was Jared Lorenzen uh, at that time. So, you know, it's telling that quarterback, throw the ball, force the ball in there because defense, when they see this look, they're going to run this coverage or, you know, this blitz, that to it. So, you know, I used to come down with these balls, you know, and I'm not trying to you know, knock our, our, our first team, our DBs or anything, but that's what made me stick around for so long and the Giants, you know, that had faith in me is because I would make plays in practice, you know, because I was still green. I was still raw coming out of the UMass. So uh, our DBs to this day that we had, Corey Webster, R.W. McCorders, Kevin Dockery, uh, Aaron Ross, Jabril Wilson, uh, James Butler, J.B., that entire secondary would tell you it was like when I used to line up against them, that I was going to try and give them the be- the best work, not only for the benefit of the team, but for me as well. Going up against starters, going ag- going up against guys who are going up against T.O. and the real, you know, and the real Randy Moss, uh, week in week out. I'm learning and I'm getting better as well. So you know, it was it was a blessing to to have that year on the practice squad that Super Bowl year. And to be Terrell Owens and Randy Moss and Joey Galloway, Donald Driver, and that was all through the playoffs. So it was that was a fun uh, it was a fun experience. Yeah, I bet it was. And I guess after the NFL, obviously you moved over to the Canadian Football League. How did the experience of the game compare? Uh, you know, the game speed is around the same it's a little faster in the nfl because the width and the length of the length of the field is a little bit smaller so your your faster athletes are moving you know fast in a smaller space as well um that was that was one thing but i I would say one of the biggest difference in canada was and i would tell people is you know in the nfl a guy would run a 4-3 and in the cfl a guy would run 4-3 but the difference is the guy that ran four three in the NFL, he'd be about six three, two twenty five. The guy that ran four three in the CFL is tend to be like, you know, five eleven, you know, one one ninety. So it was just smaller like it was just the NFL was bigger athletes doing athletics doing some of the same athletic stuff, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, uh at all. But it was it was a fun transition because, you know, you're playing in a in a new league and up in Canada, they love their CFL up there. That's their NFL. So week, week in, week out, you know, I, you have a 100-yard game, score a touchdown, and you're in Toronto and you're out at, you know, Moxie's or, or you're out at some lounge bar, and then you look up at their sports center on uh, TSN, which is their ESPN there, and you see yourself scoring a touchdown, you know, because you're playing on plays of the week or, or plays of the day or something. So I still got that that professional football feel up there in Canada, that five years I was up in Canada, you know, winning a great cup up there as well, which is their Super Bowl. So I got to feel it, feel that, that experience uh, up there as well. And that's when I started getting into, uh, you know, filming little vlogs and stuff. Um, some of my teammates and some behind the scenes stuff uh, while I was up there. Um, and, and, you know, that's when my love for wanting to get into media and all uh, came into play. Absolutely, and, and obviously playing in Montreal, that kind of meant that you were in a, a mostly French-speaking region. How was the cultural yeah. experience of playing in Quebec for you? Oh, the cultural experience was so dope. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> that's just for lack of better words. I mean, it was, it was, it's a, it's a feeling that kind of turned my mind on to wanting to go see the world, you know, because when I was up there, I had only... Prior to that, I had only been to outside the country, and that was to London, and that was my rookie year with the Giants uh, when we played in Wembley. We played the Dolphins there in Wembley. So I got to go out there with the team for that. But prior to – and then I got to live in Canada in Montreal, which is kind of its own little world inside of Canada. Because in that province of Quebec, they speak French. So, you know, it, not only did I get to be, like I said, be in Canada, but you get to have this cultural experience of all these people on this island, because uh, Montreal is an island, it's a city on an island, and while you're playing up there, you're getting that football experience, but you're also getting a social, cultural experience up there as well. Um, so I think that was a blessing in my life, uh, and that, because it turned my mind on to something outside of football, 
it turned my mind into something socially and culturally. That's so cool that it like opened this whole new kind of like feeling for you of wanting to go explore. That's really cool. Yeah, it was. It's like a new world, and and being there, like I kind of tell people at times. I was just talking to one of my former uh, teammates from Montreal. I was like, being there, I felt like I was in a cocoon, and not in the sense of in the cocoon like you're trapped. It was like it was preparing me for you know when I came out the cocoon and like grew my my butterfly wings or whatever to like fly <laughs> and not only see the world but but really explore who I am and. And, you know, who it is that I want to be, you know, in life, set that foundation. So it was pretty cool. And when you look back now, how does it feel to have been part of or around these, like, championship teams? Uh, when you look back at it, it there are moments, there are certain moments within being, you know, on those championship teams or just playing football or living your dreams or living, you know, your passion in general, there's just certain moments that are, that hit you. Like they say, like before you, you, you die, you know, there's moments of your life that flash. I can see a lot of moments of my life flashing from those periods of time of football. But the best part about it is this, what I call like rebirth in life in terms of retiring and, and, and moving into, you know, other things in life and, and media or whatever is uh, I, I'm trying to create those same moments within this passion as well. So um, being able to play football and, you know, maybe I didn't have a name like Odell Beckham Jr. or Toro, like big name like that, but being able to use professional football as a tool to create another platform for the longevity of life, I think that within itself is is a blessing as well because not only did I have a good time playing it, some good experiences, I did some things while playing and I took advantage while playing to set up the rest of my life as well. So um, I, when I look back at my career, whatever, you know, obviously, you know, you would want 10 years in a gold jacket. Obviously, that's what you, what you play the game for. But on the other side of it, you can look at it and be like, hey, it was football ended up being an investment you got a chance to use football as an investment. So, you know, smiles all around. <laughs> and what are your biggest <laughs> memories from playing? And was there anyone in particular who, I guess, played a huge influence on your life? Uh, yes. I, in two moments. One moment, um, my senior year at UMass, so my last uh, home game, it, not only is it a night game, but it was during the playoffs against our rival, uh, University of New Hampshire. Another FCS team was Atlantic 10 at the time. It's a CAA. But it's, uh, if we won, we go to the semifinals uh, the next round for the FCS playoffs. And my grandparents had drove from Hampton, Virginia to Amherst, New York for the game. And that's the last game they've gotten to see me come, um, uh, come and play with their, you know, with their eyes. They're still alive, but it's just, you know, after they got old and, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't able to, like, really travel to see me play after that, uh, the Canada and the, and the NFL and stuff. But uh, they uh, they came up, I scored the game-winning touchdown that game. So, you know, that's, that's definitely a memory because my grandfather, you know, he still kind of brings that up from time to time where he got, he got to see that. Mm. And then uh, the second one would be when uh, it goes back to my rookie year when we played in, in London – and that's when I started. I got introduced to to uh, Chelsea FC <laughs> my senior year at UMass because my friend would play with Chelsea uh, on FIFA, and I, I never played FIFA until my senior year in uh, in in, co- in college. So he used to always score, and he'd be like Drogba. And I'm like, yo, I like this Drogba dude. Like, I like this Drogba dude. So we were in London and we're walking around downtown and there's like this indoor mall downtown. I can't tell you what it's called or whatever, but I know it's like just, you just, I don't know, uh, maybe you know, it's like this indoor mall. And like all you saw around London was like billboards with like, like footballers. And I'm like, man, <laughs> they really love their, their football over here. in terms, you know, what we call soccer. Yeah. So while we were preparing, we were over there for like five days. We got to go to, uh, I think it's called Cobham, Cobbleham, Cobham. Chelsea's training facilities because we practiced there one day 
And I think we got to meet some of the players. I forget the three players, and I think one was Ashley Cole, because for the longest, yeah. he was one of my favorite players on Chelsea. He used to date Cheryl Crow. Yeah. And I remember one time on <laughs> on, uh, on TMZ, it was like y'all's TMZ over there. They had a picture of him smoking cigarettes. I'm like, oh, what are you doing smoking cigarettes, bro? You're, <laughs> you're a world-class athlete. You know, it was, it was just weird. Like, I'm not hating on him or knocking him. I just remember that feeling when, like, when I looked, I was like, oh, that's weird. You smoke cigarettes, bro? But uh, we, got to meet, uh, we got to meet some of the players. So I was like, you know what? This Chelsea squad is going to be my team. So, uh <laughs> So that's another memory going over to, and that's why I love Chelsea. That's a story about why I love Chelsea FC. And the next time I go over there, I'm going to Stanford Bridge to go see a game because I haven't been uh, to a game yet. Absolutely. Any excuse to watch it, hey? <laughs> yeah. Um, so after you retired, obviously you talked about how, um, you know, you do like little video blogs and that kind of thing. Did you ever see your media career becoming what it is today? Uh, yes, because, uh, even though Holly, like when I, when I were uh, retired from Canada, I retired and moved out to uh, LA full time and was just like, you know, I want to, I want to see what I can do. You know, I still had another year left in my deal in Canada and, you know, you're making good money up there and I just walked away from it. And, uh, out in LA, it was like, even though you would go out for auditions and people would still think, oh, you know, you're not raw. I mean, you're raw enough. You're too raw for this, or you're not ready for this major production. I was still booking like little thing by little thing uh, at a time to like keep me going out there, if that makes sense. Yeah. So even though I wasn't on like Fox or, or doing national TV or anything like I'm doing now, I would book like, a little part in, in a Verizon commercial here or like, or a little part in a, like a Delta ad or something like, you know, little things along the way that just kept money moving in to continue to train and get on camera training. Um, but to also continue to go out on auditions and stuff like that. So when I got an agent, when I got introduced to my agent, that's when I started going out on like really good auditions. And uh, that's when I got the Giants gig, and uh, I, I, that's when uh, I started doing the Giants uh, full time. And then um, there was another daytime show that I, I booked, but I was still green for that. But I booked it, but got released from that. And it, but I got the footage from being on that for a little bit to uh, to uh, to get me into the audition for this Daily Blast live show that I'm on now. And uh, you know that little bit of time that I spent on that morning show, not only did I grow. But it, like I said, it got me the tape that I needed to put on a reel to get a, another uh, or in a bigger show, down, which is what I'm doing now. So it's all a blessing. You know, it all kind of everything kind of worked itself out in a way. But I still had to go through it, you know, go through the fire to really mold myself at, you know, as an on camera host and to, to really make that transition into this new world. And absolutely, that's it. So, like, you know, there is life after football if you make those right steps. And obviously that's something you built the foundations for, like, as you're coming to the end anyway. What kind of advice would you give to a player now who's, I guess, coming to the end of their playing career? Coming towards the end, um, anything and everything that you think you've had some sort of interest and passion in, go check it out. Whether if you're in the off season right now or whether it's a class that you want to take or some TED Talks, no matter what it is that you think has tickled your fancy or, at, you know, at one point of your life or interests you, go check it out. Like, go at least, you know, go, go ask questions about it to see if that gets you into that new thing to be your passion because you're going to have to find something to replace that passion with your mind. Also, workout discipline. Ooh, when you retire, <laughs> you got to find some sort of yoga or something because it's, it's the worst thing in the world not having to, to work out to get ready to compete. Like now you're just working out just so you don't, just so you can eat, you know, junk food <laughs> and stuff. It, it's a different type of motivation. So find a way to keep that motivation. Absolutely. And you talked about your dad earlier. Um, what was it like, I guess, growing up the son of a football coach? Did you feel like any extra motivation or extra pressure to kind of prove yourself? Honestly, 
No, because I was so immersed in that world. It was just like what I was, that's the only thing that felt comfortable for me as a kid, you know, that, that work being up on, being on sidelines and being the ball boy, you know, being around at practice all the time, being on the jugs as a kid, like that was, that was just life to me. You know, my dad used to take us into the facility on weekends when, uh, you know, people would be off and all, and we'd work out and then we'd break down film with him. He's writing like recruiting letters to players. I've been writing, I would forge his signature, like write out the the address or whatever, and then go and do his signature. And then he would, you know, I would have to lick the envelopes and send it out. You know, I would do that stuff for him to make money in high school. But I wrote letters, Michael Vick, um, uh, Ronald Curry, all those guys back in the day were around when he was like recruiting, when he was at Boston College and stuff. So, I mean, that was just a, it didn't feel like any pressure at the, at all growing up it just felt like that was my life that was what my life was going to be like you know I knew I wanted to play professional football and I knew football was going to be part of my life my entire life for the rest of my life or whatever so it wasn't it wasn't any pressure it's like hard to explain or whatever it's just it wasn't any any pressure or whatever that's why I'm glad I got the Giants gig because it's hard for me to watch football in the stands you know even when my sister, my sister plays women's professional football, even when she has games, I have to find a way to mosey on the sideline, you know, just to feel I need that energy from the sideline, from the field and when I watch football. It's, it's crazy. I it's just, I'm, I'm just so used to it. Like, that's what it is, you know. Like, I, I love it. I'm, I'm, pr- I'm, I'm very thankful to be able to be around, you know, that energy for so long and have that part of my life, you know, even at Giants games. Um pregame on the sideline and all so um like but to answer your question no there was no pressure it just I just felt like that was my life yeah it definitely sounds like you know that was a natural step for you and obviously is still now a natural step for you to be involved like you say from the sidelines your sister and stuff so no that's really cool yeah and I mean the thing about football for me now and my you know the gig that I do with the Giants TV and doing uh, stuff for them, how I get to connect with the fans. I think that is a new passion for me as well. Like I get to do the fan cave, and I even did a fan cave in uh, in Flimby, in Flimby, UK, in Cumbria. <laughs> I took I took the train from Manchester because I flew into Manchester and I hung out with a friend there for a little bit, and uh, I, I took the train up to Carlisle, and I took the train from Carlisle to Flimby, and uh, there's a guy up there. His name is Tony Little. He's a huge Giants fan, and uh, he has a a fan cave. And uh, I I go and I film these fan caves, and we air them on our TV shows for the Giants. And I went up there, you know, I hang out. So that's what I'm saying. I've done one in in Germany as well, a Giants fan cave out there. So I love the fact that I've connected with the fans, and I think that's going to be what gets me into the NFL networks and the ESPNs for their shows is my niche is going to be my connection with the fans. Um, and that's what I continuously work on with Giants TV and all. So uh, uh, I would love to do some stuff with the NFL UK. I've reached out to uh, Olsi Yumanuro, who was a former teammate of mine. And, you know, I, well, obviously when all this stuff uh, calms down, I want to go over there and show reels or show what I could do for the NFL UK when it comes to, you know, content with the fans and all. So um, I think, you know, being able to be connected to the fans the way I am through the Giants is going to help me tremendously in my career uh, going forward. Absolutely. And, you know, it's funny, I'm um, I'm speaking to OC next month as well. So, yeah, I mean, what was that like playing with him? Yeah, OC, OC, you're, you're the man. Like, <laughs> I, I, the, the, around that time, he was, a, he was a celebrity athlete at that time, you know, and that was before all the the Instagrams and all that really blew up. Like Twitter was new. Social media was still relatively new in terms of athletes being able to use their brand, um, you know, to make money on, on social media and all. But uh, also used to be on MTV Cribs. He was on MTV Cribs here. (laughs) He used to date uh, a supermodel. And also he lived that, that cool rock star athlete lifestyle that a lot of, you know, a young player like me at the time looked up to. That was my motivation in a way to have like a career like that. Not only was he taking care of business on the field, 
But off the field, he was living that Derek Jeter ish, you know, type, <laughs> you know, type lifestyle. Just in terms of, you know, the rock star athlete lifestyle. So yeah. as a young kid, and uh, like he and uh, Michael Strahan used to say uh, how they had Mox. Moxie was their word back then. And I kind of being like little bro, I've kind of like implemented that into my whole brand into like who I am. So being able to watch uh, he and Strahan as ki- you know, I, I say as kids, when I was like a young pup uh, rookie, being able to watch how those guys moved on and off the field or took care of business on and off the field, that right there, that helped shape and mold how I thought about sports and entertainment. And I guess speaking of like personal brands, tell me more about this whole hashtag cultured athlete. Uh, cultured athlete is, I mean, that was my brand I created while I was in Canada. While I was playing football in Canada because I've always loved the culture of sports, everything behind the scenes of sports, um, you know, fandom, the, the work that it, an athlete puts in, uh, you know, physically, the mental aspect of sport, uh, and just, you know, where people come from. There's so many different backgrounds when it comes to sports, sports lifestyle, sports culture, that it's something that brings us together in a unique way. So the coach of athlete, that's what I created when I was uh, in Canada because as I was growing, I was maturing into something, and I was maturing into being more cultured on, you know, all types of not only events but politics, social injustices, like everything, entertainment, everything, spirits, you know, being spiritual, everything. So, uh, Cultured Athlete is kind of like the the growth and journey that I've been on um, to refine myself. I love that. I think that's really cool. Yeah, it was, you know, I I thought of it in a special teams meeting um, in Canada. (laughs) I was was sitting there because I wouldn't, I wouldn't play. I was inactive. I was hurt. I was hurt, and I was just sitting there writing down concepts and ideas and videos that I wanted to shoot. But I still had to be in the uh, in the special teams meeting because after I would finish, uh, since I couldn't go practice or anything, I, I tore my meniscus. I was out for the year. Uh, coach Mark Tressman, who used to coach for the Bears as well, now he's, he's the head coach for the XFL Tampa Vipers, Tampa Bay Vipers, or whatever. He used to let me go to theater. I, I start, that's when I started taking theater classes. I enrolled in Montreal School of Performing Arts um, because I was hurt. And I didn't want to just go out to practice and just stand on crutches. So I asked him, I was like, hey, man, um, can I go and start taking, you know, enroll in a theater class? And after I do my rehab and sit through meetings, when you guys go to practice, can I go to class for the day? And he okayed it. And that's, you know, that's when I started doing that. I believe that was 2012. That was really cool that you kind of had the opportunity as well. Yeah, well, that was a blessing for sure. <laughs> awesome. Well, listen, it's been so good to talk to you today. Um, it's been really cool to kind of hear your story. So, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, this was fun. And hopefully I can make it to one of your meetups this year. You know, hopefully travel is, you know, is, is eased, you know, towards the I hope, first and foremost, I hope we can have a football season, but kind I'd love to, so. you know, try and do something with you all, go over there, you know, uh, I would love to get over there and, you know, first pints on me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you're always welcome over. <laughs> okay. Well, take it easy and thank you for having me on. I think Brandon has a great story and I hope you enjoyed listening to it. For me, I loved hearing what it was like in that transition from college through to the NFL and to the CFL, and I love that it helped open his mind to traveling the world too. Join me next week when I speak to Chris Wessling, writer and co-host at Around the NFL. Until then, thanks for listening.